Welcome to this uh, afternoon parallel session. My name is uh, Mons Kirkeby and I'm president of the International Sport and Culture Association. The reason I'm here is I'm in the program committee of Play the Game and that gives us the responsibility and honor to chair sessions. Uh, this will be the first session <coughs> which starts on time. It will also be the, one of the first sessions where there will be time for debate, I hope. <coughs> I made a deal with the presenters that they stick to the time given. And uh, as I see, this is a very international setup. We have uh, six or more countries represented in the panel, depending on if you take the nationality of the speakers or the place they live. So an international setup, and also with the quite uh, core business of Play the Game, with the title this afternoon, Playing with Credibility, and actually the subtitle is not so credible, it is the corruption in international sport organization from different uh, perspectives. 
I will uh, give a very short introduction to the speakers, uh, which means that we allow them to elaborate if they think I missed the good parts. And uh, first on stage is Deborah, Deborah Unger, uh, manager of the Rapid Response Unit. I think that sounds very nice. Rapid Response Unit of Transparency International. This is a, a co-presentation uh, with Bob Monroe, uh, a long-standing supporter of uh, Play the Game, and uh, Deborah will also introduce Bob when that's uh, the time. Welcome, Be Deborah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch, and welcome back to the session this afternoon. Just let you know a little bit more about Transparency International and why we got involved in corruption in sport. TI was founded in 1993, and its mission was a world free from corruption. We're still working on that. We have 100 chapters around the world, and they all pick different areas of corruption in which they want to work on. Mostly, it's in the political and in the private sector also. But starting in about 2008, we started looking at sports as an area that would be of interest to us, because more and more stories about corruption were coming out, and would be of interest to other people, and where we could spread our message of integrity and accountability and transparency through the area of sports. But you can't spend, spread that message if there is corruption in sports and if there's corruption at the top of the major sporting organizations. So we were focusing on the areas in sport that needed to have the clean broom of Transparency International, the light shone on whatever metaphor you would like to use. We came out with a working paper in 2010 we followed this up with some re a reform map from, for FIFA, which I will talk a little bit more about later. And now we are coming out with the main reason I'm here today, which is the Global Corruption Report on Sport. Oops, back. This, every few years, Transparency International focuses on a particular topic that we think is of great interest in the fight against corruption. In several past issues, we've used education, climate change, the judiciary, and this year, we're focusing on sport. The Global Corruption Report aims to be a compendium of the most recent research in the topic, stories, articles that illuminate the subject, and also give conclusions and recommendations about where we should go next. We have here, I have here a few copies of the full contents of the publication. You can also go online, and I'll put the uh, address up in a minute, and you can see the, report, the articles that have already been published and look at them. You can sign up for alerts to get more information when articles are published. And you can see the scope of the, org of the whole Global Corruption Report on Sport. It's basically put into six different areas. We're looking at governance, the money in sport, we're looking at match fixing, mega events, participation, and U.S. collegiate sports as a separate section because that's a, um, something that people don't know quite so much about outside of the U.S., and I think it's a very good indicator of how you can spread a, 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 the problems that are going on with young people in sport. You can sign up also for a full copy of the sport. I've got a sign-up sheet here, and I hope that many of you will to see the full issue. We also have um, the executive summary. And in all these areas, we offer recommendations. And these recommendations are basically drawn from our work in the public and the private sector, how you can apply them to the sporting world, what kind of bodies you need, what kind of transparency you have to have, in sports organizations. And I would encourage you to um, have a look at these and comment on them. We want to start a dialogue. We don't have all the answers. 
we come to organ we come to meetings like this to meet people who are more specialist in certain subjects and they can help with us framing the right way to go about tackling corruption in sport. And I'd also like to thank a number of the people in the room who are authors and contributors to the Global Corruption Report in Sport. Um, many of you here have been working with Gareth Sweeney, who unfortunately couldn't be here to give this presentation himself, so I'm stepping in to talk for him. And one of the sections that we deal with in the Global Corruption Report for Sport, for sport is uh, participation. And I want to talk a little bit about, and perhaps encourage people to help me on this, and help Transparency International on this, is an initiative we have been starting to try and get fans more involved in the issues of corruption in sport and transparency. This started with um, collaboration between the Irish football supporters and TI Ireland and Gareth, who is a major Ireland fan. Now they. Irish supporters and their group, you boys in green, were particularly angry at the Irish Football Association for two reasons, both to do with transparency. The first was the allocation of tickets to away fixtures for the national team. This was very intransparent. They, no one really knew how this was working. And the second issue was the 5 million euro payment that the FAI got from FIFA for the Thierry Henry handball that knocked Ireland out of the World Cup and no one knew this happened and they wanted to find out more why did the money come what was it going to go for so we got together with them and they said well we need to have more transparency in the game this is a design we have for a sector flag to go into football matches and the idea is and it hasn't been in there yet because there are many different difficult reasons why it's hard to get something this signed into a football stadium is that the fans would unfurl it, it would have the logos of the supports organization, the, the supporters organizations that were in favor of this. We're working, we hope, with um, Football Supporters Europe and Supporters Direct as well to figure out ways how this can become a reality, not just in Europe, but also we want to try and find organizations in the rest of the world as well where we can have this unfurled during a game and call on the fans to be more involved with the transparency and accountability in their clubs, in their organizations. Whoops, I'm not very good at this. And then we continue our work with FIFA. Um, we came out in 2011 with Safe Hands, which was a roadmap for reform, pretty much not taken on board by FIFA, which was perhaps not surprising. We were initially a little bit enthusiastic and hopeful. I think that was because we were coming in from the outside and hadn't been following this for as many years, as many as you have, thinking that possibly 2011 was the time for change. There had been major scandals. The organization was the butt of many jokes. Maybe they were going to embrace the message that we gave them. They didn't, and here we are a major FBI investigation on, a second report, and we've shifted a little in our ideas. Before we thought that they could reform and have a few outsiders in to help them along, now we are not so sure. We think that they need an independent reform committee, so we're joining up with new FIFA now. We don't think that they have what it takes to do a root and branch reform themselves. They'll need outsiders to do it. Um, so that's where we are with that. So that is the um, address of the web page where you can read quite a few of the articles that are already published for Corruption and in Sport Initiative or the Global Corruption Report Sport. The book will be out in February 2016. It is coming out, I think, two weeks before the presidential election. We will be having launches, I think, uh, confirmed in Nairobi and in Rio and in London and possibly elsewhere. And we'll, if you sign up for it, we'll let you know and hopefully you can even attend some, one of those launches where the debate will continue. This is obviously not the last word in how you tackle corruption in sport. And now I'd like to hand over to Bob Monroe, who in essence is doing exactly why, doing things that exactly why Transparency International got involved in sport. It's sport for good. It's how you can take sport and teach the values of 
that you want people to grow up with, you want to have integrity, you want them to be accountable, you want them to be self-sufficient and self-reliant and understand the rules of the game. He's been doing it, and he will tell you how. He has a long experience in sustainable development in the United Nations, and he now lives in Kenya and has transformed, basically, football in Kenya, and I'd like him to tell that story, and I also have printed copies of his article if you want afterwards. So I'm going to hand over the podium to Bob now. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. The, uh I'm glad you, you kept it short by focusing on the good points and didn't go in, 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 in your introduction to any of the bad points. But uh, I'm uh, Bob Munro. I've uh, been at Play the Game for three sessions earlier. But I've always been here as a, as a witness for the prosecution. So today I'm, I'm actually happy to be here as a witness for the defense, the defense of sport as a force, uh, as a force for good. So, uh, as Deborah said, the Global Corruption Report will has 50 or so articles on uh, on the dark side of sport, and uh, and a lot of the issues we've been discussing here. And as she said, there's quite a number of people at Play the Game who who have contributed articles to to the report. So the, they asked me for the introduction, as the the most of the report focuses on the ugly game to to focus on the, the beautiful game. And, uh, and so I did. Uh, I won't go into the intrinsic values of sport, not in a room full of such lithe and athletic people who already know the intrinsic value of sport. But I'll focus on the, the sport as, a, as a, a force for good, not only in the community, but in the country and internationally. And that started in uh, 1987, when uh, I was in the Mathari slums, saw the kids playing with their Juala string and paper ball, had a flashback to my own youth uh, in St. Catharines, small town in Canada, and how my ice hockey games in the winter and our baseball in the summer were organized by volunteers, by our, our fathers who coached and refereed. And so I always felt a uh, what I learned in that, what I and my friends learned from those early sports activities, uh, that uh, I owed them because it did influence the sort of person I became later in life. And, uh, and so when I saw the kids playing with their Juala ball, I thought, why, you know, why shouldn't these kids have the same chance that I and my friends had? And that's how MICE started. But I had a big family and a consulting company uh, to run. So I made a tough love deal with them, you know, to sort of protect myself. And that tough love deal was, if you do something, I'll do something. And if you do nothing, I will do nothing. Well, that deal turned out to be a big mistake. The, uh, I had no idea at the time of the ability of these youth and their determination to do things once they had an organizational structure and some goals. And that's how MICE started and kept going. MICE is owned and run by the youth. And the first linkage was, as you heard, I didn't list soccer as one of my sports when I was a kid. It was ice hockey. Uh, but they wanted to play soccer, so you, do, you get something from the community, you put something back into the community. And that started off with garbage cleanup. All the teams do garbage cleanup. And even today, I think we're the only sports league in the world, still 30 years later, where the league standings say games won, draw, lost, Garbage cleanup points, total points. So you can't win the league without cleaning garbage as well. And then it spread to AIDS prevention, uh, sexual violence and abuse in the slums, uh, creating slum libraries and study halls because they don't have electricity, they can't even study at home, uh, into music, dance and drama. Uh, and these are not things that I chose. These are the things that the youth chose because they own and run MISA. And, uh, and now that's over the last 20 years has become global. Uh, 
starting around 1999, 2000, Laurier Sport for Good Foundation and the, the World Sports Academy uh, combined to, to start networking the, the then still limited number of sport for development projects around the world. And then uh, Jürgen Griesbeck, who is here at this meeting, uh, uh, started uh, Street Football World. And uh, it is a huge and enormously positive force for good worldwide. Uh, and, uh, and then there's others, uh, the Swiss platform for uh, sport and development, the uh, Beyond Sport conference now, the Sport for Peace conference. So there's this huge number of networks and hundreds of projects now around the world. And that's what's at risk when we're talking about corruption in sport. Because as in Kenya, my previous papers here basically had the title Greed versus Good Governance. And that was, that was the issue uh, in Kenya. The, uh, they're not just stealing money and not just stealing the future of the sport. But from the perspective of those of us living south of the equator, they're stealing the dreams and hopes of talented young people who are looking to help themselves and their families out of poverty through sport. And uh, that, uh, that's the missing element. So I hope you, you really embrace that. That's the biggest thr uh, uh, threat that corruption is making, to, uh, in my view, to, to sport. It, it's, it's really pulling the rug out of a lot of good initiatives hundreds of them now around the world, particularly in the South, that are poverty reduction <laughs> programs. Sport is a poverty reduction program. So to conclude, I'd just like to focus on briefly on three issues that I think from the discussions I've heard earlier today as well. Uh, the first is, it was famously said by an arrogant president of General Motors that what is good for General Motors is good for America. And that's the problem in our sport is there are too many sports officials that think, that think what is good for them is good for the sport. And we need to reverse that now and make sure they understand that what is good for the sport is good for their organization. And we've got to keep that, that structure and I think that's the way we should be assessing FIFA presidential candidates, for example. Where is their starting point? Is it FIFA or is it the good of the game? Uh, secondly, the, uh, the other challenge as a, as a way forward is we need to look not only, because I thought it was an interesting insight on the format of our competitions as a way of dealing with match fixing, but the format of our leagues as well. So I said to Declan yesterday, English Premier League, Bundesliga, what kind of match fixing do you find there in the last 10 years? Very limited, at least of what we know so far, he says. Add the Kenyan Premier League, because the feature that those three leagues have, and the Premier League in South Africa, is that they're owned and run by the clubs. As soon as you have a league owned and run by the clubs, like the English Premier League, 20 teams, you have 20 auditors. The money belongs to the clubs, and they make sure it's spent properly, so that issue goes away. When you have shareholders, you have democratic decision-making and transparency. Automatic, goes with the territory in that structure. And thirdly, you have fair play. One official or a referee favors one team, the other 19 teams are gonna fire them. So I think we need to look at that structural issue. And finally, what I'd like to see more of is, as you'll see in my introduction, the harnessing of sport as a force for good and expanding it significantly. And so all of you associated with sports organizations or government or clubs or teams, there's a lot more that can be done. On the same principle that the Mathari youth do, if you do something which you're doing to help them get to where they are, then, uh, then you'll do something. But you have to get them we, we have to use the power of sport much more actively than we have in the past. So Deborah, finally, I hope 10 years from now, you'll do a global corruption report 
where you'll have 50 articles on sport as a force for good and you'll have an introduction on corruption in sport. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah and Bob, for this introduction. And uh, go visit the homepage or wait for the book. Or go visit uh, Bob in Matara, Kenya. Next speaker, Morali Christian, a journalist and international broadcaster based in New Delhi, yeah. India. And that is maybe a very brief presentation of you, uh, Morali, but uh, please uh, add if you think the good part is missing. So I've been a broadcaster for, I mean, I've been a, a journalist for many years, over 25 years in India. The last five years I've become a foreign correspondent for several radio stations. And uh, today I'm speaking on India's missed chances. I want to start off with a small YouTube, which perhaps is anecdotal, but nevertheless will give you a small glimpse of what I'm trying to say. Can you play that? World Cup. Let me tell you something about the World Cup. It's not the fucking World Cup. You know why? Because the two countries that represent me are never in the World Cup. <laughs> Canada and India are never in the World Cup. Canada, for obvious reasons. It's a world event. <laughs> we don't get involved in world events, you know? We look at the U.S. Are you guys going? Yeah? Oh, no, go ahead. That's great. Yeah, go ahead. Sure, that's perfect. Yeah. No, no, we'll, we'll stay back. We'll tidy up. Sorry about it. Let's go. It always bothers me that India is never in the World Cup. We're the second largest population in the world. There's 1.2 billion people over there. We can't come up with 11 fucking guys to make a team. <laughs> you know what the problem is? You have no idea how hard it is to kick a ball straight with curly-toed shoes on. <laughs> We're standing in the middle field. I'm open! I'm open! <laughs> Where the hell is the ball going? It always freaks me out that the Chinese... Right. That was only largely to explain the fact that, you know, he talks about football, Russell Peters here, an uh, Indo-Canadian stand-up comedian. But the fact is, we had the potential to emerge as a, a superpower after the Commonwealth Games in 2010. And it was uh, an occasion which we missed so badly. Now, corruption charges sort of completely swamped the games. It preceded the games, it succeeded the games. And uh, we had this ability to build up a good sporting culture. That was a good, good kick-off start, but we never managed to capitalize on that. And the reason because is because, you know, politicians were in charge of the games. They were in charge of the games because that's the practice which has been in India for many, many years. And we thought at least this would be a, a wake-up call. In two, t four years down the line, the kind of money, that t uh, five years down the line, the money which was spent on the Commonwealth Games, which was close to $4 billion, it's almost about 16 times the original estimate of $270 million. And these are photographs of the stadia as, as, la as late as last year. That is the uh, Indira Gandhi Sports Complex, uh, named after the f India's first uh, woman prime minister. The Talkatora Indoor Stadium. Wha a crore, uh, for anyone who don't know, uh, doesn't know, a million dollars makes 50 crores. That was the prevalent uh, exchange rate at that particular time. That's the state of affairs now. That's the Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium. The seedings are all falling apart. The, the Major Johnson National Stadium, where hockey is played, it's in a state of disrepair and disuse. And this is the iconic General Nall Stadium, where, where the athletics uh, ha events happen. And this is, what's, this is what's happening outside. Another view of the stadium. Uh, that was the grand opening of the uh, uh, Commonwealth Games, the balloon which came in from the United Kingdom. David Cameron has told Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister, before he embarks on his trip next month to uh, UK, that he wants India to pay up 29 uh, million pounds because we still have not paid up many contractors there. 
another long view. The rubbish which is piled up. That's what it is. India's sporting culture is all rubbish. And, you know, after the disaster which surrounded the games, and though the fact that India did extremely well in terms of medal tallies, you know, we came second to Australia. We won 101 gold medals. Uh, I mean, 30 gold medals. And uh, we came second after Australia. But has, it, has India in any way made a step closer in terms of making a strong bid for other games. Could this have proved a, a perhaps an impetus for us to stage other mega events? Unfortunately, sadly, no. I mean, this has not been just a rude wake-up call because, it, like I told you, the allegations of uh, corruption, the kind of overcost which ran the, uh, the games, the kind of uh, contracts which were given to dubious uh, uh, players, all sort of seem to sort of dominate headlines, not so much the fact that India did well. And therefore, and that was the reason why India thought that they could still muscle their way through. And, uh, and because of the fact of the corruption allegations, the Indian Olympic Association decided to draft two of the corrupt people back again uh, into the IOA. And that's when the uh, International Olympic Committee cracked its whip and said that, no, they, 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 they banned India, and we had to actually play, go to the Sochi Winter Games with the IOC banner. But apart from the fact that that was a sort of a slap on the wrist for India, no, that, was that a hindrance to sort of usher in more reforms? No, that's not. In fact, I thought what, the, what, what has happened right now in the state of affairs of Indian Games is that we have not learned anything at all. I mean, they have been, they have been, they don't, they've not even been tentative steps to build up a sports culture. I mean, actually, sports culture should actually begin at schools. In a, in a, in a country like India, where, half of its where three quarters of its population lives in its villages, that talent spotting, that, 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 that ability to sort of spot talent, to integrate rural children into schools and allow them to play games, that has not happened. That was one of the perhaps the ideals of the Commonwealth Games, to spot this talent, build them up, let them play at the block le village level, the block level, the district level, take them to the towns, the bigger towns, and then the cities, and, and expose them. That has remained a pipe dream. And it's very unfortunate. The fact is, what continues to dominate Indian sport is cricket. And cricket, too, is now in the news for all the wrong reasons. The cric in cricket, you know, the, the analogy which I'm trying to draw out here, cricket is like a, a banyan tree in India. A banyan tree in Indian folklore is that, you know, it does not allow anything else to grow under it. So the banyan tree is like cricket. And it does not allow a, a blade of grass to grow under it. And, because, and, and therefore, it does not allow rebirth or renewal. And this is exactly what's happening. But now, there are small changes which we see. We see, small, we see sports, other sports disciplines, like badminton, like kabaddi. Kabaddi is, a, is an Indian sport which is obviously played in the Asian Games. We see uh, football. We see uh, uh, badminton. All we are now seeing leagues. Sports. Sports. Uh, we, uh, there was this, the Supreme Court moved in Suomoto, saying that enough is enough. We have not learnt anything at all. They set up, to, they set up a, a judicial commission to go into bring up a national, national sports bill as, as well as another bill to, to tackle... Uh, probity in sports. It's called, it was called the Mukul Mudbul Sport, a national sports development bill and a, sports, and a sporting fraud bill. This was a very good, two good bills which were, which were drafted very clearly to ensure that, you know, how sports can be built up right from the grassroots level to take it down to the, to the cities. It's been two years. The, the, that, th those bills still lie in the union cabinet. It's not even come to the uh, parliament at all. So therefore, the larger point I'm trying to make out here is that there is very little political will in India to sort of inculcate a sporting culture. 
I, I'm not saying it's the politicians which you have to do it, but it's the political will which needs it to drive it down right up to perhaps your, uh, to, to your villages. And that unfortunately is missing and very badly missing. Because the fact is, I see abundant talent. I don't cover sports, I cover corruption in sports. But I, when, I, when I go to some of the most impoverished parts of India, be it uh, the northern state of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, I can see good talent out there. But unfortunately, they do not have infrastructure. They do not have people to guide them through the various processes. These are small boys and girls who've got fire in their bellies, but they do not know the way ahead. So, therefore, the, 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 what needs to be done, I, really, I mean, everyone knows what needs to be done. And we have had many corporate giants like Lakshmi Narayan Mittal, a steel magnet who's trying to promote uh, good athletes who, who can sort of step away from the, uh, the national uh, sporting banners. And he has helped them in many ways. But at the same time, I feel that there is a lot which needs to be done. So with all, these, with, with all this which is said and done, I think that I have a very pessimistic view of how sports, how a vibrant sports culture can ever be uh, sort of initiated, let alone grow in India. Thank you. Thank you, Murali, for this not very optimistic picture of Indian sport and the future, but uh, something to dig into if you want to reveal corruption in sport, I guess. Next speaker, we are going a little bit north to uh, also huge country, city of Moscow. And from there we have Sergei Yulo, a lawyer, sports law researcher, and member of the Russian National Unit for Sports Lawyers in Russia. Please, Sergei. Yes? Yeah. Hello everyone, my topic is uh, creating of an effective sports governing body in the Russian Federation. Just a few words about uh, the current situation uh, in international and national sports federations. As we know, FIFA and other uh, international sports federations are in crisis. For example, FINA, Federation Rensonale de Natacion, uh, a governing body for swimming and aquatics uh, cannot tackle uh, the commercialization of sport. For example, uh, swimming finals in swimming pool at the Olympics uh, 2016 are scheduled at uh, one or two o'clock uh, due to uh, television companies for TV rights to obtain am at night this is made uh, due to uh, television companies for TV rights to obtain money but uh, they uh, oh. they, c they do not want to uh, to keep in mind that there are a lot of rights of athletes that rights of athletes are being violated uh, that's the problem. For example, other issues is doping and uh, disqualifications of efforts, sports federations. For example, the Russian Swimming Federation uh, is not well structured. Uh, and uh, national swimming federations. Uh, as to Russia, we note that our uh, sports federations, for example, the Russian Swimming Federation uh, is not well structured. Uh, uh, the most important values in the Russian Sports Federation's governance are the first, uh, there is no work on the protection of rights of athletes. The second, uh, there are no jurisdictional bodies 
entitled uh, to resolve sports dispute within uh, a national sports governing body. Uh, and the third, it's bureaucracy and uh, there are no opportunities for young people, uh, for former athletes, for example, who would like to, uh, to be a part of a committee or a panel or just uh, to, to be a part of federation. <coughs> How bad governance affects uh, rights of athletes? Uh, there are some key points. For example, uh, our athletes do not have the right to compete in sporting competitions. Uh, our athletes are restricted in uh, sports dispute resolution opportunities as far as they are prohibited from recoursing to national courts. Uh, therefore, for example, uh, the Russian Football Union or the Russian Swimming Federation inserted a clause uh, in its internal uh, regulations that uh, a swimmer uh, cannot uh, recourse to a national court of general jurisdiction and uh, all disputes between swimmer or and uh, the Russian Swimming Federation uh, should be resolved uh, in uh, national uh, sports arbitration court. Uh, that's the problem. <coughs> More importantly, athletes cannot elect members of governing bodies. Uh, uh, how about governance affects the entire sport? Uh, uh, here uh, we note that there is a sometimes there is a difference between our plans and the current situation. For example, we plan to uh, win, for example, seven, eight, seven, eight uh, golden gold medals, uh, but afterwards we win only one or two. Uh, that's uh, on international and national levels. On national level, uh, Russian middle level athletes, here I mean uh, school athletes or uh, student athletes, which are not members of the Russian national team, cannot improve their results participating uh, in a large uh, number of swimming events. Uh, basically, they can participate only in uh, student uh, competitions. Uh, uh, and the last one is that facing a risk of suspension, disqualification, uh, a Russian team or uh, simply an athlete is alone and uh, he should rely on himself because the Russian Swimming Federation and other governing bodies do not have instruments to help him uh, in reality. Uh, <coughs> what are the suggestions? Uh, I suggest creating, uh, creating several uh, bodies entitled for dispute resolution, for uh, legal consultations for uh, analyzing, etc. Uh, <coughs> because uh, I think that there is a direct relationship between the quality of sports governance and the protection of rights of athletes. Uh, the first body uh, that should be created is a uh, sports ombudsman. Uh, a sp ombudsman should first uh, the notion, you can see it. Uh, firstly, the Ombudsman should act as uh, initial dispute resolution uh, instrument. And the second, uh, secondly, he should protect rights of athletes. As a sports dispute resolution body, the Ombudsman uh, should uh, resolve daily ongoing, uh, for example, uh, disputes arising out of, uh, of the training procedure, uh, individual civil contracts, swimsuits issues, and etc. And uh, at the end, he should provide parties to a particular dispute uh, with a brief or with main findings. Uh, who, are the, who the parties are, what are the facts, 
evidence, references uh, to applicable legislation or uh, rules of internal statutory acts. Uh, <coughs> as an advisory body, uh, the Ombudsman should provide advice on a free of charge basis, uh, consider complaints against uh, actions and actions and decisions of officials of the Russian Swimming Federation, for example, uh, re represent athletes before national courts, sports arbitration courts, and other uh, judicial bodies uh, participate in the legislation procedure uh, in State Duma, Russian State Duma, Russian Parliament, uh, draft and file requests to, ru to the Russian governing bodies and uh, assist sports federations officials in drafting internal statutory acts uh, based on his reports uh, and based on uh, communications with athletes. The second body is legal committee. Uh, because actually in Russia, in the Russian Swimming Federation, as I know, we have uh, a lawyer, one lawyer, just one lawyer, uh, which uh, who is obliged to deal with uh, uh, basic or ongoing legal issues, for example, uh, lease contracts, civil contracts with customers, with uh, producers, and on the other hand, uh, at the same time, he should uh, deal with sports issues. I think that uh, it's not a good idea. Uh, <coughs> maybe uh, the uh, legal committee should consist at least of uh, five lawyers. Uh, the, uh, the allocation of responsibilities you can see here. Uh, for example, lawyer number one should deal with doping issues only doping rules violations, analyze uh, practice, analyze uh, substances, analyze uh, cases, draft recommendations. The second one should deal with general legal issues, for example, contracts, uh, lease, civil, etc. Uh, the third and the fourth uh, should deal with internal statutory acts only, draft uh, competition rules, regulations, uh, rights of athletes, etc. And the fifth uh, should deal with ongoing sports related issues, for example, provide consultations, uh, round tables, make alerts, reports. Uh, sports, as to sports dispute resolution bodies, I think that every uh, national or international sports governing body should constitute a dispute resolution system consisting of at least three stages. Uh, <coughs> there is a charter, uh, body of the first instance, internal, the second, body of the second instance, of the third instance, internal. Uh, afterwards, uh, there could be CAS, Court of Federation for Sports. And the last one, uh, there should be an opportunity to appeal the above mentioned uh, decisions of the above mentioned bodies to national court of general jurisdiction, because uh, otherwise it would contradict the Russian Constitution, uh, Article Number Forty Six. Everyone uh, should have the right to appeal to a national to a state court. Uh, doping committee uh, should. Uh, conduct tests, provide official uh, consultations to the athletes, uh, uh, conduct uh, meetings, roundtables, conferences, where uh, should explain to athletes what doping is, how to tackle it, etc. Analyze, provide information on uh, sports substances. <coughs> and committee of analysts uh, should analyze foreign experience, uh, review and analyze provisions of foreign uh, statutory acts, and, uh, for example, conduct uh, research in organizing uh, mega sporting ev events. Uh, and what about proposals and the future of the Russian sports governance? 
some people, uh, some officials believe that uh, there should be a new uh, supervisory authority. For example, uh, it uh, can be ma uh, can be named Ross Sport Nadzor. Uh, this body uh, should supervise compliance with Russian uh, law on sport, uh, other federal laws, and uh, statutory acts of the Russian Ministry of Sport. Because uh, uh, at present nobody does it. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, Rosport, this Rosport Nadzor will be entitled to impose sanctions on sports federation. Sports federations disqualify athletes uh, and will conduct uh, inspections, both in written or in other forms. That's uh, my, that are my suggestions for inquiries, for questions. You see email. You're welcome. Thank you, Sergei. This is often the case at Play the Game. It turns out after a very positive start from Deborah and Bob that we have a positive situation and then we reveal something that's not so positive. Thanks to Morali and Sergei. Uh, the, the question is, will this continue? We are now uh, going to the next speaker, Krista Ahal. And uh, when we speak about Krista Ahal, we speak about international handball. And Krista is a former council member and president of the Playing Rules and Referee Commission in International Handball Federation. And if I'm not mistaken, also uh, Swedish citizens, citizen or at least nationality, which is the same as where the name Ombudsman come from. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I was a little bit taken aback when I realized here in the last couple of days that there were so many veterans from previous conferences here. So I said, well, surely they will say, oh, not him again, and not about that same old topic of the International Handball Federation. But please don't blame it on me. There are two culprits. Well, first, of course, as always, Jens Sayer Anderson, who is, as you know, very convincing, shall we say, and wouldn't let me off the hook. And second, and perhaps more important, the IETF president, who is even more persistent in his habits and methods, and that therefore gives us reason to uh, continue to focus on the IETF. Uh, uh, just to add, by way of background, a couple of words to be on what Moons was already saying, a, explain correctly what was my final position up to 2009 in the IHF. I had then at that time been there for probably still the longest serving in, uh, official in the IHF for 32 years in different positions and representing the continent and being a referee instructor and rules expert and so on up to that point. So I know how IHF can function both in good days and in bad days in old fashioned with old-fashioned methods and in a more modern setting. But uh, unfortunately, my leaving there was related to a situation that has continued. I was not wanted any longer because I had seen it necessary to speak up about the ongoing corruption that was simply too much for my mind to tolerate, particularly coming from the refereeing side. And also, to some extent, the effect of my having managed to prevent a blatant case of uh, what I can only describe as match fixing that the IHF president and the well known and powerful sports figure Sheikh Ahmed uh, had been behind a few years earlier and uh, where they had not gotten their way as it happened, something that they had a hard time swallowing. But anyway, back to the, the situation as, as it has evolved in more recent years. 
I, th I think it's fair to say that the situation, frankly, has gotten worse year by year in recent time. And especially in the sense that we now have begun to see, as the uh, heading for my talk suggests, a move away from plain and simple governance issues in the form of what takes place in the, in the meeting rooms and in the uh, corridors to what now affects how the game is played on the court with situations where blatantly teams are being uh, given favorable treatments in games and where the IHF interferes incorrectly in terms of the decisions regarding which teams are allowed to participate in championships. But before I talk about those new developments, just commenting about uh, the long-standing manifestations of the IHF president's despotic regime. Everything we hear is that the atmosphere is getting uh, steadily worse, simply because the IHF president is acting in an even more authoritarian way than before. Decisions are getting more outrageous. He feels encouraged by the fact that he's getting away with everything. And when it has now gotten to the point that nobody in the IHF structure really co ever contradicts the president for fear of retribution, then people don't see much hope for change, of course. On paper, there is a structure that an outsider naively would think implies that there is an element of democracy or checks and balances. But this is the problem if one just looks at the structure without knowing the, uh, how it's functioning. And that is why I must admit that I'm very skeptical about self-reporting about how international federations and, uh, function, because it can really be totally misleading. I, th I think if those who are today suffering inside or, or f uh, from the IHFs um, malfunctioning, see some of those things that were suggested in the sports government report at, as the strengths of IHF, they would think it would be uh, amount to a bad joke. There is nobody in the executive committee who speaks up any longer, and the IHF council is totally under the control of the president. It has gotten to the point that, for instance, the European nations, uh, they simply have given up trying to influence what is happening. They are aware that if you don't have the votes to actually win uh, in a, a decision-making situation, but still uh, argue your case t too strongly, then chances are that you and your continent will be punished for that act. The Congress is based, as in so many other federations, on the system of one vote per country. And this, of course, includes a huge number of countries where handball just barely exists, if at all. And when those smallest nations come as voting members to a Congress, they are very loyal because they are so content with the financial and practical support that they get personally and for their federations. Ironically, this is because they are so inexperienced for the most part that they don't realize that what they're really getting is nothing more than breadcrumbs. Because in comparison with FIFA, the IHF simply doesn't have the resources to throw a lot of money around. The budget is, is amazingly modest, and the proportion of this um, uh, small budget that goes to the development aid is in the neighborhood of 10%. So you can imagine that what, what is being used, uh, and it's rather sort of impressive, if you wish, in a sense, to control all these national federations is really very limited resources. So what that really means is that when we have now heard about the framework and a good example provided by the IOC about uh, new opportunities under Swiss law, about efforts by the Council of Europe and European Union, this means really very little in these circumstances. International federations who are managed in the way of, uh, along the lines of IHF and FIFA, uh, they, what they need is not autonomy and being pointed to, to uh, best examples, uh, they really need, plain and simple, to, uh, to uh, have revolutionary change imposed on them. 
And this has now become even more clear, as I was hinting at at the outset, because of recent more frightening trends. Before we, as I said, could see the problems as mostly governance issues. The main example was what I was also hinting at, the scandal surrounding the Olympic qualifying in 2008, when the intention was to manipulate through absurdly biased refereeing so that Korea would lose its place to Kuwait. However, on that occasion, it was perhaps felt that the fraud was facilitated by the IGF president, but that the initiative and the main blame should fall on the Asian and Kuwaiti federations, which were then under leadership of the well-known Sheikh Ahmed. However, the main recent manifestations of such influence took place during the Men's World Championship in Qatar earlier this year. As is well known, Qatar is seeking to use the realm of international sports to project soft power. And the most conspicuous and controversial example of that, of course, is their uh, hosting the World Cup in football in 2022. It's perhaps a bit surprising, but also indicative of handball's more obscure position in terms of media attention that the awarding of this year's handball event did not receive similar scrutiny. And this perhaps also explains why, for the purpose of demonstrating this soft power, that it wasn't quite enough for Qatar just to be the host. Their team also had to be seen as extremely successful. This was, of course, easier said than done, given Qatar's modest position in the world ranking. Or perhaps I should say that, with the help of unlimited financial resources and dubious practices, it wasn't so difficult after all. Qatar has one of the strictest laws in the world for becoming a naturalized Qatari citizen. However, for a star athlete, it's in fact quite easy and lucrative. Qatar's view is that by definition, a star athlete who agrees to compete for Qatar at the international level is to be regarded as a Qatari and he or she obtains a citizenship on at least a temporary basis. In addition, the athlete is likely to receive a financial incentive of major proportions. And of course, a large number of members of the Qatari Olympic teams consist of such citizens, which may not be a concern from a fairness standpoint in individual sports, but when that method is used in team sports, it's a different matter. So this approach combined nicely with the IHF's very generous rules for recognizing nationality changes, in sharp contrast, for instance, to the strict rules of FIFA. So suddenly the Qatari handball team had 11 recent imports from handball countries in Europe and North Africa. Not necessarily world stars, but players who could combine to form a very respectable team, especially after training together under a top coach for a long time. That may have been enough for a decent result in the World Championship, but not quite enough for the image that the Qatari were seeking with IHF collaboration. So after the team, mostly on account of its own strength, managed to qualify for the main round, the unpleasant circus started. In three consecutive games, the Qatari mercenaries received incredible favors in form of refereeing. Not in a laughable, but in fact in a rather skilled way, you could say. If this happens in one game, it could perhaps be a coincidence, but not in three consecutive games. And what was also remarkable in what were known to be very sensitive and, and difficult games with a lot of pressure, and uh, the IHF made sure to keep away the referees with a top reputation for absolute integrity and toughness, and instead allowed the games to be handled by, shall we say, less resisted couples. In this way, the Qatari team managed to find its way all the distance to the final against the defending champions from France. International spectators in Qatar and around the world on TV and the internet were shocked and disgusted. So as you can see, as Declan Hill talked about this morning, match fixing can, in some of its worst cases, come from within and not necessarily from the outside or from uh, the uh, mafia or anything like that. So perhaps it was then a small consolation that the Qataris must have felt somehow that appearing in the final and winning the silver medals w was good enough to meet their objectives. So suddenly in the final, the refereeing was more or less back to normal and the French team could win without much controversy. But a final twist came then a few days after the event 
had finished when the heavy international criticism uh, suddenly seemed to dawn on the ITF president that the ITF rules for nationality changes had had an unfortunate impact, shall we say. He pretended to have just realized this problem and ordered a review of relevant regulations. Of course, as is known particularly in, in, in Denmark, forewarnings about possible abuse of the regulations had been heard for years when Qatar was attempting to poach star players from other countries. So the clear impression was that the IHF president deliberately made sure to keep the rules the way they were until after the Qatari had been able to benefit. More recently, as reported in, in media, also here in Denmark and some other countries, there has been time for one further in incident regarding referee bias in a world championship. In the under-21 event last summer, there was a conspicuous incident where a team from Egypt, which happens to be the president's own home country, was given the gift of a victory over the heavy favorites from Sweden. One can only hope that when the Women's World Championship will soon be played here in Denmark, just over a month from now, we will be spared this kind of embarrassment. Instead, I'm more concerned about what seems to be a rather political decision regarding the nomination of the referees for this event, as none of the very top couples have been appointed and as several couples do not really have the experience and quality that fits this top event. The ITF president's caprices have also started affecting the decisions regarding which teams are entitled to participate in world championships. ITF has always followed a very simple and normal practice of establishing prior to each championship, uh, on the basis of results from that event, how many teams from each continent will be allowed to participate next time. This has, of course, ensured transparency and clarity for the continents and the nations. But suddenly, the IHF has begun to practice capriciously of overriding those regulations and ignoring the rights of nations affected by changing the allocations after the fact. This has been done supposedly for marketing re reasons to eliminate some weaker teams, especially Australia has, has been hit by this and some Latin American teams. And also with the purpose of ensuring the participation of some popular handball nations who failed to qualify, especially Germany. This totally unethical approach, of course, goes against all sound principles for sports competitions. Finally, there's yet another situation where the ITF president recently interfered in a matter which involved fraudulent behavior in competitions in a continent. In a country which has notoriety across several sports for such behavior, the National Federation engaged in a systematic falsification of passports to enable many players to participate in junior continental and world championships for which they were too old. And even in, ca in cases where players were not at all citizens of the country, they were given false passports to be able to play. The Discipline and Ethics Tribunal of the Continental Federation investigated and obtained both evidence and confessions for the actions just uh, described. And in addition to suspensions for the specific players who had been detected and for the Federation official who instigated the fraud, the tribunal also suspended Federation teams from continental competitions for a certain period. This was due to the very serious nature of the fraud and the fact that the Federation officials and players had been generally aware of the fraud but helped conceal it. And this um, uh, kind of punishment was exactly in line with FIFA's traditional handling of similar cases, which they have had a number of, where they proudly announced the decision to give precisely the same type of strong punishment as a deterrent. However, in an apparent attempt to avoid publicity, and to, as it was put, to protect the image of international handball, the IHF president and reportedly put pressure on the Continental Federation to override the decision of the independent tribunal, and he simply had the team suspensions removed. Regrettably, it's difficult to believe that these types of action will come to an end in the absence of a regime change. And there is every indication that the president will seek re-election in 2017. So it's understandable why an exas exasperated persons in the world of handball really see no reasons for optimism. And with that, I thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Krista. When uh, you have experienced speakers on the podium, you know you need a little buffer. So I think Krista took a little of the time buffer. That's okay. We have time. In the good spirit of uh, play the game, we finish off this uh, panel presentation uh, with a journalist. Uh, Umaid Washim, journalist, Pakistan. You can tell the good part too. Hello everyone. For the last two years, I've been covering corruption in Pakistan football, mostly related to goal projects and how they haven't been built. As you can see this image, this is a goal project in Karachi, which is Pakistan's biggest city. And this one was awarded in 2006. It hasn't been completed as yet, despite all the funding FIFA claims that this is in working condition. This doesn't even have a pitch there, and it's built near the sea where grass can grow. So here are a few quick facts about Pakistan. We ranked 177th in the world. The national team hasn't played a match since the first round qualifiers of the World Cup. Well, that is a picture of a league match. This is a picture of another goal project in Quetta. The president, a politician himself, has been in power for the last 12 years. We were awarded eight goal projects in the last decade. Just one is complete, and that was the, FIFA, uh, the PFF headquarters in Lahore. So yeah, crazy stuff. But yeah, this is where I start off. When I started investigating the projects, so I came across four of them. I sh showed you a picture of Quetta in the previous slide. These four were awarded by Manilal Fernando during the time he was rallying for votes. So now, you look at the state of these projects. My question is always, I ask the PFF, why didn't you get a pitch? Well, they got a building. And you see, how can you grow football? They always tell me that once the goal projects are complete, they will start youth development, but do you see kids playing in these buildings? So then I did this story. So Dr. Chung actually gave Pakistan a flood relief project for which he gave 400,000 US dollars and the AFC added another 250,000 to it. Well, the fact is, the project never started. The PFF got the money. It's in their bank accounts. And we remain here. Why the AFC didn't send an inspection team for the site? They just transferred the money. They did nothing else. And they didn't follow up until my story was published. And after it was published, what did the AFC do? They wrote to the FIFA investigatory chamber. They asked them to investigate. That investigation, we all know, will come down to nothing. So yeah, this is the man. He's very influential in the AFC. He's a member of the executive committee, the chairman of AFC's legal department. And according to my friend James Dorsey, who's sitting right there in the back, he was the guy who thwarted an attempt to establish an ethics trans task force in the AFC. And now he's one of the most ardent backers of Sheikh Salman, who's running in the FIFA election. Well, interestingly, this year, he held an election at a private place. The AFC ratified the election, which was crazy enough. He had a legal committee of the PFF, which had Congress members in it, and anyone who was go not going to vote for him was handed out a ban. So well, the FIFA, FIFA sent a committee into Pakistan. They looked at the situation. Well, it wasn't surprising for us. They gave him two more years to hold fresh elections. And now we're waiting. Well, what it should have normally been a normalization committee. Now he gets two more years. He's been asked to ratify the constitution, make it according to FIFA rules. That's how it goes. But yeah, how the PFF is run is like this. We get a coach for free in an election year by the AFC president when he was elected in 2010. 
13. This is from the PFF Congress minutes, and it clearly says that the AFC president is giving us a coach for free for two years, and by availing the services, we will like save a lot of money and would go into development. Well, that never happens. The team didn't do really well in the last two years, and yeah, right now we're standing here and with nothing to play. So yeah, that is it. And when I like started writing on this, they got after me and my organization issued us legal notices. We're fighting a legal case, but we're very optimistic. We'll win, and I'm, I'm very thankful to my organization for supporting me during all this. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, and I would like to invite the speakers to the podium. Uh, we have a good half an hour for discussion. You can choose if it's football, if it's handball, if it's Pakistan, India, Russia, Kenya, or just transparency, international. Think about it and uh, be ready. We have mics, two behind you, and uh, six persons up here are wired, they are ready, who want to comment or question. I think uh, questions uh, ends with a questions mark. If you want to comment, make it brief. Yeah, let's go. Name and question. Do I need to stand up? Okay. Uh, my name is Hanna Maria. Uh, I'm from Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. Um, very surprised to hear about this uh, Pakistani way of uh, making football arenas. Can you tell me a bit more about uh, how money is it involved in this? Uh, what has been uh, done with this? And uh, uh, that was a strange situation not to finish the pitch. Yeah, I agree with you totally. It's a, it's a crazy situation. Every FIFA Gold project gets 500,000 US dollars. So we got eight of them. Just one is completed. So you can imagine the rest of the money. We can just calculate it. It's 350,000. Oh, more than that, sorry. Uh, in the PFF account at the moment. Um, they don't release an audit report. We don't know what happens to the money, but I got a copy of their audit report last <coughs> year. So, I mean, but still doesn't show where the money went. But a bit of it has been invested in these buildings, but I'm investigating further to how actually it was spent. Other comments and questions? Uh, I'll also invite the panel to uh, comment on each other. There seems to be space enough for you. <laughs> uh, could, could, you uh, could you give an advice? We know these gold projects. Uh, I wonder how a silver product looks like, if a gold product is without grass. But uh, feel free also in the panel to, uh, to comment. Um, Please. Yeah. We're currently looking at um, governance in the 209 FAs just on a very, very um, small... Uh, we're saying we're putting the bar very low. How much information they publish about their activities, how much, uh, whether it's possible to find any information about their financial activities, their, whether they have statutes, whether they have codes of conduct. Um, very, very few meet even the lowest standards of governance. Now, if they had all this, would they still hide the money? Would they still have problems in the government? They probably would, but we like to put out information, the more information you have about what people are doing, the less likely they are to get away with doing the wrong thing. So we're, we're going to try and publish this in the next couple of weeks, um, just to show that reform in football needs to be 
bottom up and top down and that even if you have the best people at the top of FIFA you've got to also look at the governance at the federations around the world as well. Thank you. Morali, are there similar, uh, similarities between what uh, Umaid says from Pakistan and what you've discovered in India? Is that the more or less same story? No, no, no. That's quite a different uh, story altogether. His was specifically to football stadia in Pakistan. Mine was to the general sort of uh, state of affairs in terms of building a sports culture in India. Just, I just wanted to throw a question to the audience myself, you know. They say the next century belongs to India and China. You know, the sense that we know that China is a uh, sporting prowess. But I was wondering, for my own, for my own sort of uh, knowledge as well as curiosity, how much of you know, what in your reckoning you know India in terms of for just for sporting? Any games which you associate with it? <laughs> Sorry? Badminton. Cricket and badminton. Cricket. Okay. Right. Okay. Your gold medal winner, the only one. Sorry? Your only gold medal winner in shooting. Right, absolutely. That's it. As I'm saying. Good guy. Uh, Just. Just. <laughs> yeah, right. So I just wanted to uh, sort of an idea over there. You know. Yes? Uh, well, um, in uh, my country, Norway. Um, we are tr trying to follow up on the Indian Football League now because we have a Norwegian player at right. uh, Delhi Dynamos. So, uh, and they have been picking up quite a few former star players, I, I believe. Um, and, uh, and so they are trying to uh, create a global audience, I think, the football side. The Indian Sports League is sort of gaining in traction. You know, it's two years now. It's, it's g gaining eyeballs, more viewership. You know, just as uh, as it's happening in kabaddi, as it's happening in badminton, um, but I won't be surprised another couple of years down the line, whether we uh, w uh, when a corruption scandal hits the Indian uh, football league as well. Indian sport, yeah, uh, it, it won't be too long. But that's the way. That's what, that's that's the way it's sports is governed in that country, in my country. I'm sorry. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, no, that was actually a follow-up on the on your question. Uh, uh, according yesterday in the session on philosophy in sport or rethinking philosophy of, of sport, they were talking about sport not being the only body culture and not the co dominant co body culture in the future. And maybe India has something with yoga and the traditions of other bo body cultures there, so you can show the way in that way. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's uh, showing the way. We had the a big yoga day, yoga international day, which got declared by the UN. But that's not, but that's not the point. The larger point I was trying to make was 2010 was a mega sporting event in India. The Commonwealth Games, where humongous amounts of money was put in. And one would have imagined that, you know, uh, the administrators would have taken a cue, tried to instill confidence among, you know, the lower levels to try to build a sporting culture, inculcate a sporting culture in the academic curriculum right from, the, right from, the, right from below. And that, that, that has not happened. In fact, what we know the Commonwealth Games for is all for, for all the wrong reasons. And uh, there has been no course correction so far. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah, we have one coming up. Uh, before that, I would like to ask you, Sergey. Um, a lawyer and uh, also introducing a model with a lot of lawyers in the federation. But my question is, what is the feedback, if any, from, for example, a swimming federation in Russia on such proposals? You are critical on the current structure, but you also give a new structure. Do you have any feedback on such uh, uh, proposals? You. Now? Yes, please. Unfortunately not. <laughs> Do, I, I guess you can either foresee the same or something after this conference because... As uh, a former swimmer, I'm trying to change the structure, change the situation, but not feedback from the Russian Swimming Federation. <laughs> okay. But feedback uh, from Alexander Popov? But unfortunately, uh, he does not hold an office uh, in the Russian Swimming Federation, as I know. 
uh, he holds an office in FINA. But he's tr I believe that he's trying to change something, but he's alone. Thank you. We have a question here. Yes. My question is for oh, uh, name. Deborah Unger. So my name is Gigi Alford, and I work at the U.S. State Department in the Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. <coughs> and fortunately, my leadership cares a lot about anti-corruption. Uh, so the question I have for you about the, the six um, areas within the study that you did, you mentioned participation, and I wondered if you could comment a little bit about the indicators for that. And two, I wondered if the subject of reprisal threats uh, came into your research at all. Uh, in the sense that many of the governing documents of the international sports bodies um, include provisions of um, principles of non-interference, for example. And so if there are ever investigations or any other type of uh, perceived interference from government uh, bodies, there can be threats of suspensions or expulsions. And I, I think that can even trickle down to the level of player. And I wondered if that... Um, fits your definition of corruption and how that fe features in your studies? Well, there is a whole section on, on uh, autonomy of sport. And um, yeah. Jean-Luc Chapelet, who is a major expert, he's written a, a piece on that. So yes, you, th that's in there. Most people seem to really have a hard time um, trying to figure out how to balance autonomy with government intervention and reprisals. And I think that um, we see too many examples of how it's <coughs> used for political means and it's also used to try and reinforce the power of the sports organization. And there are a few articles in here about that. I, I tell you to have a look at the, the table of contents. Participation also, we look at athletes' rights and we look at um, how that is used and used against athletes and threats in different areas and, and also in areas of match fixing as well. There are a lot of articles in here. I think it's probably better if you pick up a, um, a copy of our uh, table of contents and have a look at them. Um, that was mostly what you were saying. I think one of the other areas that we do focus on in the me mega events and that goes into the democracy uh, is the human rights angle and how that is becoming more and more important in the bidding and hosting um, criteria and, and will have to be and that every there are louder voices now than ever before and I think the spotlight on Qatar and the kafala system has has really brought that to the fore though it is not the only example of how mega events have gone in and destroyed human rights in various areas so um, there's a, there's plenty of that in here as well and we would really encourage people to comment and bring their own ideas forward as to whether the issues are being covered properly, whether they agree with the, the answers, they agree with the propositions. We have a bunch of recommendations, and they are in the, um, they're in the uh, executive summary. And uh, it, it's really putting it out there for you in the community to, to see whether we're on the right track. For example, we have one recommendation to look at the possibility of a world anti-corruption agency, a, a water for corruption, and how that might work. Is that a good idea? Is it not a good idea? How would that work in practice? Is there enough out there? A lot of you are really expert in, in, in your fields and in your areas of research and in what you cover, and you can contribute greatly to this debate. In fact, you could start some discussion now if you, if you would want on some of the issues that, that we're, we're bringing up. And the other one that I wanted to bring up with you, I'm taking a bit of time here, is uh, this whole idea of participation and getting fans' involvement. Do you think Fans for Transparency is a good idea? Now the uh, ball is going the other way. Now the panel will start asking the audience <laughs> questions. Yep. But I think it's nice. Uh, feel free to comment on the questions or ask your own question. Well, could I, uh, that is the uh, same for you, Bob. You started very positive. Are you still a positive man here on the panel? Well, <laughs> I have to provide a little bit of antidote to that positiveness. Uh, one of our biggest problems, as you heard that I flagged in the presentation, is we're focusing on international sports federations. But the real problem is the, the national uh, federations, the, the ones who are, who are voting them in at the international level. So what happens in, 
certainly in Kenya and East Africa and, and large parts of Africa. It's the same pattern. Around election time, the leaders who are coming in, they're, they get you know, clubs on their side and they get players and that on their side and they put out all kinds of brochures on a new vision forward. As soon as they're elected, within days after they're elected, they sideline the clubs, the coaches, the players, and, and coalesce as, as officials. And then they change their constitutions to perpetuate themselves in power. It's, it's, and, and keeping them outside, locking them outside of the decision-making process. For example, uh, at the confederation level as well, uh, the acting president of FIFA two years ago got an amendment through his general assembly of CAF uh, that only those who are members of the CAF executive committee can stand for the position of president. That, it's that kind of closed-in system. But on the legal aspect as well, there's this lovely phrase in football which they've embedded in even standard, the standard FIFA standard statutes. And the phrase is, bringing the sport into disrepute. Now, you know who uses that phrase most? The people bringing the sport into disrepute. <laughs> and they use it against those who dare to report on how they're bringing the sport into disrepute. It's one of the sad ironies that uh, that, that phrase is uh, the one that's most applied to the people who are trying to do the right thing and are reporting the right things and, uh, and trying to do things the right way. Thank you. We have a question or comment? Uh, yes, uh, it's Scott Jedlica from Washington State University in the US. Um, and to uh, Ms. Unger's question, <laughs> um, a question to answer a question, perhaps. Um, I'm intrigued by the, the fans for transparency, um, and given some of the comments made by uh, Dick Pound and Jamie Fuller earlier in the conference about using economic levers to affect change, um, has your organization considered uh, working through the fans to um, enact economic boycotts of sponsors or organizations as a way to pressure organizations into uh, meeting certain benchmarks? I think that's a, a very reasonable idea. It, it worked with the, um, with the clothing industry um, and child labor. At the moment, we're not such a loud voice out there that we, can, we could really mobilize the fans ourselves. We have to start from, the, from a smaller platform and build up name recognition and get our voices heard. Um, we are working with Avaaz, and we are trying to brainstorm ideas on how to reach l larger numbers of people. Fans tend to want to know what's on the pitch rather than what's off the pitch, so engaging them, we're thinking of engaging them via their um, representative organizations as uh, people who would be more, in, more interested in taking on the issues like transparency and accountability. Um, I don't think that we're big enough to, to force a boycott. The fans, that's going to have to start elsewhere. But I think it is a, 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 a good idea. Um, fans themselves, as the fans groups will say, are, are awkward and difficult um, to engage. There are some fan groups who you would never want to be involved with or we would never want to be involved with because of their belief structures. There are others that we would be very, very happy to work with. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one. Can I add one more? Please. Yeah. This campaign will certainly, I think, uh, have a, a good chance of success in Europe. But in Africa, for example, uh, we don't have many fans. There's only a few countries or clubs like Tanzania has Simba Yanga, so they will get 20, 30,000 in their stadium. But most matches, you're talking about thousands. And, and the reason for that is because our best players are taken north. Uh, our newspapers are full of the English Premier League, and it's hard to fight for space 
equivalent. We, we now get roughly the equivalent same space, the Kenyan Premier League as the English Premier League in our own newspapers. Uh, the television rights and the television broadcasts of English Premier League and Bundesliga and La Liga are competing with our own matches on the weekend and our own fan base. And, uh, and even our sponsors, our potential sponsors, are, are sort of taken by the Barclays Bank in Kenya has an Arsenal banking card or a, a credit card for Manchester United. So there's this huge, when you look at the football in the world, there's a huge vacuuming effect going from south of the equator to, to north of the equator. And, uh, and so we're, if you go to a Kenyan and say, uh, which club do you support, the Arsenal or Manchester United, uh, we're, we're trying to deal with that. It's very difficult. And that's why I like this argument about rebalancing football. Why, why should people buy the English Premier League rights for Kenya without being required to invest some percentage of those rights in growing the local game, which produces the players that helps make the English Premier League look good in the future? One question is for... Rali and uh, Umaid, and actually also for Krista. How is an instrument or an institution like uh, Transparency International, is that useful for you in your job or at all in the process in your political cultures? Well, um, I think because most sports federations <coughs> are by politicians, I think Transparency International could come in and help make it better because I mean we all advocate transparency in sport we don't know what happens in our federations at all so we need it we need these federations to tell people what they're doing with the money that they get with the funding that they get because we really don't have an idea until unless we investigate what actually happened with the money Rally? Well, I, I really want to know, first of all, how much of a footprint does Transparency International have in the Indian subcontinent? You know, that would be the most uh, relevant question to ask at this point, because from there, perhaps I could perhaps spread it out. I, I doubt whether it has... It, it doesn't in the Indian subcontinent. Our chapter in India is um, less effective, but our chapter in Bangladesh is really good. Yes. So in Pakistan, they're quite noisy. You probably hear them. Um, making complaints, we're not a we're not an even across the world. Yeah. Um, India, unfortunately, is a. We hope it's going to get better soon. Yeah. So therefore, in fact, is I I never seen Transparency International's name figure in terms of no. whenever corruption or anything happens in the sports uh, arena, and so that's why I I I I'm not in a position to comment on where how it could possibly help. Krista, and also Sergei, is uh, Transparency International something that you could consider using, or is that a no-go in Russia? No comments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I can, I can comment on that. <laughs> Transparency has got a very good chapter in Russia, and they have done lots of very good work in, in sport as well, and they did it on the Sochi Games and the overspending and the contracting that went into those um, stadia and how it was given to favorites of the government, etc. One of the problems in Russia is that a non-governmental organization is always under threat. And in order for them to survive in Russia, they have to label themselves as foreign agents if they take money from outside of Russia. And that means, in Russian, that means they label themselves as spies. They are currently in the courts um, fighting this. They will lose. Um, and we hope that they will continue to survive in Russia. It is not a guarantee that they will do that. They will speak out um, about the 2018 and any of the problems that go into that, but um, I hope they s I hope they're there till 2018 to do that. There is an irony next week. I'm going to St. Petersburg for the um, United Nations Convention Against Corruption uh, meeting, and that's being hosted by the Russians. And one of the Article 19 of the UNCAC, as it's rather ungainly called is the participation of civil society in the um, moder uh, monitoring corruption around the world. 
and we find that the space for civil society to do that is being uh, restricted far too many places. We've heard about Azerbaijan, and I think that we should all challenge the gentleman from Azerbaijan who's going to speak after four o'clock um, about what's happening there. So that's my soapbox. <laughs> Kenya, Transparency International has had a, a major impact for 15 years. Uh, the first head of Transparency International in Kenya, John Gothongo, uh, was in 2003 appointed from that position, appointed directly to being in the office of the president and an advisor directly and reporting directly to the president on any corruption. Uh, what was interesting there as well, talking about using sport as a force for good, is we had mega scandals going on then in Kenya, hundreds of millions of dollars. But those, that, those numbers are so incomprehensible for most Kenyans that, that John uh, uh, used football, which all Kenyans are addicted to, as a way of uh, getting the corruption, anti-corruption message across that Kenyans would turn around and say, well, our, our football was so corrupt, but now it's, it's better. And if, if they can do it in that sector, then maybe it will encourage and inspire uh, anti-corruption efforts in others. That partially worked. Uh, if, to find out how John managed to uh, read Michaela Rong's uh, It's Our Turn to Eat, which is basically a story of of John's uh, work there. He's also on the MISA Board of Trustees. But I would, uh, Transparency also, we had a tournament called the Transparency Cup, dedicated to kicking uh, corruption out of sport, uh, which made quite an impact as well. Uh, but I, I've always teased our friends in Transparency International is that uh, they have the wrong name. <laughs> Even Peter Eigen, I've teased him about that, because in Kenya, the, our Kenyan Football Federation has for a decade been transparently corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And, and they don't make any bones about it. They're, they're transparently corrupt. So I think maybe in Kenya you need to vary the name of it. Transparency is good, but not the solution we hear. <laughs> we will come back to you, Krista, but we have uh, one question. And before you ask the question, and Krista, I would like to, which is far beyond my competence as chair and member of the program committee, but I would like to conclude this session with having each of you expressing one wish to play the game as institution or community. I cannot fulfill necessarily all wishes, but I can bring it forward to the leadership of play the game, or maybe the community in front of you will take care of it. So if you have one wish, for the play the game community or institution at the end, think about it. Question and then Krista. Um, hello, my name is Ursula Starakiewicz uh, from Poland. And uh, we talk a lot about transparency, that we need more transparency. Uh, and I think about our Polish federations, sport federations, I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. But actually, uh, from my research, I see that they are quite transparent because no one is really interested. No one uh, actually asks many questions. And uh, I, I did my research with uh, journalists and asked them, why is that? Why is that? And one of the, the answers that I'm going to talk tomorrow is that, you know, people don't want to read about that. Uh, po um, people in Poland are not interested in those kinds of uh, mismanagement. They, if they don't want to read the articles about uh, mismanagement in FIFA, if you look at the indicators, no one reads that. So my question to, um, to Morali, Sergei, and uh, Umaid is, do you really think that if there was more transparency in your federations, if you, uh, if you could write about this more openly, would people read about that? And uh, would that be really the case? As, as you said, Bob, um, uh, <laughs> it, there is an open uh, uh, corruption right, in, in Kenya yeah. Federation, and no one cares, right? So. Oh is yes. that transparency the cure for everything? Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. If there's more transparency, people would like to know. People would like to know exactly how these federations are functioning, how these bodies are functioning. So therefore, in many ways, when we know that its functioning has been opaque in many ways, so we have a lovely instrument out there, which is called the, the Right to Information, the Right to Information Act, which allows every citizen 
uh, in India to uh, ask questions, to find out how much money has been allocated for various bodies, how much is being spent, and you are duty bound by law to provide answers. And increasingly, we find after the welter of corruption cases in 2010 following the, the gross mismanagement of the Commonwealth Games, people are using this to find out what's happening. And I think there is an increased awareness uh, within the general public or to find out where their money is gone. It's taxpayers' money, finally. So I think it's, it's an issue which is, which is very close to their hearts. Uh, I agree with Morley because even as journalists, when we pose questions, then we are asked if we are journalists or like police. That's the response I usually get when I ask the PFF, that, are you police? I'm like, no, I'm a journalist, but I want to know because this is my right to information. So, yeah, I mean, I agree totally. We, we need to know. It needs to be out in the open. It's just crazy. Okay. <laughs> uh, in Russia, we do write articles, we do research, but uh, in my point of view, the problem is how to find a bridge between uh, sports law researchers, uh, athletes, doctors, coaches, and the government, the Russian government, uh, management of the Russian sports federations. Where is the bridge? Uh, uh, the problem is how to bring those thoughts to the government, to uh, national federations. And there should be people interested in improving our sport. Can I just add one? As Please. Well? Uh, I've been fighting corruption in Kenyan football for 15 years. But, but you know what I get from respectable Kenyans, you know, and, and even journalists, but um, uh, <coughs> even from civil society? They say, Bob, you know, in our culture, nobody asks you. We don't wash our dirty linen in public. And there's some truth to that. But I always said, well, you're missing the point. You're not supposed to have dirty <coughs> linen in the first place. But that's, that's what you're facing. You're also facing a cultural, uh, partially a cultural issue. The, this feeling, and I've raised it here with Jens and, and others, that th I don't like the term whistleblower because it, it, it has a derogatory connotation. And frankly, even when you're vindicated as a whistleblower, still people feel a bit nervous around you. you know? and, and you've seen the cases of people not getting jobs for four or five years after they've done a credible job of whistleblowing. So I, I think one of the tasks in the future is that we, should, we need to find another term. Maybe we can borrow something from the, the previous USSR and have hero of the people, you know, that's something, something like that is, which is more positive because that's what a whistleblower is, 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 is fighting on behalf of, of the people or the taxpayers whose money is being misused or the athletes who are being, their f future is being stolen. I, we need to find another term. We should not allow ourselves to be cornered into uh, sort of a derogatory term. Okay, now we will go to a real whistleblower then. In literally, whistleblower. As a referee in handball, you are a whistleblower. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Krista, has there been any uh, contact between IHF and Transparency International, or do you foresee uh, tight merits in the future? Well, I think it's in the nature of things that with the regime in, the, in an organization of the type I IHF, as I was saying already, they are not really uh, concerned by looking for best practices or uh, adopting best practices from elsewhere. Uh, the IHF president already has his role model. Mm. And, and uh, in so many discussions, either openly in the IHF council or sort of privately one-on-one, -on -one, questioning proposals, questioning practices, questioning ideas, the answer was always, yeah, well, that, that's what they have, uh, and I know from my a good friend, Sepp Latter, that they have been doing in FIFA for, for many years. <laughs> so he is looking for his guidance elsewhere. And that, of course, <coughs> you know, in an indirect way, I don't want to, I do not dare be too optimistic, but I mean, that's why I think that not just the IHF, perhaps, but possibly also other organizations that are suffering from the same kind of regimes or or governance problems that in an indirect way 
if we now want to believe, dare believe, that in the foreseeable future something substantial will happen with FIFA that could have some kind of possible domino effect uh, in, in uh, relation to other organizations such as IHF. Two things is waiting for us, a break and coffee, but before that, if any of you have a personal wish to play the game as institution or community, you can say it loudly now. It will stay in this room, plus those who are watching us on demand, our video on demand and <laughs> streaming. So if you have a wish, and after these hopefully good wishes, we will go for coffee and return here. Uh, most of you, I hope, for the mega events uh, session, half past four. But any wishes? Well, I'd, I'd like play the game to like go deeper into the PFF and do something about it. Krista? <laughs> I think uh, Play the Game should give more emphasis to uh, events happening in the Indian subcontinent. I think it's largely ignored. Krista Sage, Bob, Deborah, any wishes? Um, I think that um, it would be good. To, this panel is very representative of a great geographic spread, but it would be good to have um, more voices from more, <coughs> more places. I know that that's a financial problem, but um, it's an international conference and we're very Euro-centric here at the moment, so I think that would be my wish. Well. I said this panel was not representative, I think, of other, other panels. Yes. <laughs> when I come to play the game, I have two sort of conflicting things. When I first come, I just feel very comfortable. Nice to be in a meeting surrounded by friends and not have to watch your back all the time. <laughs> and and be able to have real discussions. On the other hand, by this time, you know, halfway through the conference, just before lunch or after lunch, the second day, hearing all these stories, I start getting a bit depressed as well. You know? <laughs> so maybe just before lunch on the second day or after lunch, we like Monty Python now for something a little different. We have a little session on good news stories. Before or after the second day. Thank you. Anyone wish? Sega, any wish? No. Nope. Krista, no? <laughs> okay, I have uh, one wish left then. Give these uh, five speakers, six speakers, an applause before coffee. Thank you. So please sign up for the Global Corruption Report. It's, yeah. um, I've got a sign up sheet here. Um, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. And for you as well. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. The, uh, thank you for being such a good shepherd. You know? And without barking. You know.